everybody. My name is Rafa Kiborowski. I'm, I'm working for Embedded Development. We do it at home with my companies and my office. Embedded Development on BSD systems. Predominantly for BSD, but we also do an MGSD. I, I will tell uh, also a story about MGSD as an example by the end of the talk. Okay, so I'm running the development team for the company. And I, I'm also with the FreeBSD project. With, uh, with, when I was involved with various FreeBSD development on embedded architectures, mostly ARM and RBC, but also some minor data store. So this is this is where I come from. So let me tell you more about the embedded world and FreeBSD in particular. So the layout of my of my talk is that first we will talk a bit about embedded systems, what it really is, and what we we'll talk about here. Then I will try to, uh, to highlight you some specific trends that are seen in the embedding industry. And uh, maybe from the view of our customers and uh, vendors that use uh, embedded software, uh, and ESD in uh, specifically. Uh, so, so I will try to, uh, to give you some examples. So what's happening right now, what's the most um, uh, hot uh, item and then we'll talk about the FreeBSD, how it's positioned within, uh, within the embedded uh, applications, if it's, if it's where we are good at, what we need to improve, and what, it, what, is, what are our challenges uh, there. And then I will, I will give you some, some real stories and examples how we, how we are doing this, uh, uh, how we embed FreeBSD, uh, but also, also give you an example about FreeBSD. So that, that's my plan. If you've got any questions, just throw it. You know. So as I said, so let's try first understand what, what is embedded, because everybody says, well, these are embedded systems, it's, it's embedded, this is not embedded. So embedded systems are really all around you. Everybody is carrying a handset, so it's, it's a typical example of an embedded system. And uh, if, if you take like this printer, this this guy is playing this presentation. These are really embedded systems in a traditional sense. So there's some um, computer system running and powering this, uh, executing some software. Similar to Internet of Things, the law. You are embedded the system, embedded the company. You the law for Internet of Things system Things. Yeah, the Internet of Things concept is one of the upcoming and, and this, way uh, this uh, situation. Yes. You, it's important to uh, the security because uh, the uh, Internet of Things is uh, a very important uh, situation is uh, the security. Because yeah, but in order for this concept, the Internet of Things, which means machine to machine communication, or is man, man and machine communication. On the, uh, from my smartphone, I can fit for my house or uh, turn off uh, a light or turn off uh, uh, continue the other. Yeah, yeah, this is all these all these elements have some computers, computer systems full fledged really as we will see, mm -hmm. that they are embedded, which is built into something that, that, that construct a whole complete and closed system. So the problem with defining embedded is really that it's it's difficult to to say and draw a crisp and clear line. Uh, because the world, the world, the embedded world, and what is traditionally not, not embedded blur, and as we will see during the presentation, the aspects of the traditional, traditional embedded systems disappear slowly and embedded uh, architectures and CPUs, silicon systems, they try to compare uh, areas that were traditionally on the commodity market by the x86, AMD, and in general PC world. So we will see this. Historically, embedded systems were considered small in, in, in many terms, in, in many ways, in many aspects. Like they were small physically, so they were built and buried somewhere, like in a lamp or uh, or in your camera that you, that, you, that you can carry. But also they were simple in the sense that, that it was a computer system, but with limited resources, like the CPU computer was relatively slow and less powerful than what you were uh, running on your desk or uh, in a laptop. So they, they were small, they, they had little memory, and, uh, uh, and they were simple. One of the characteristics of, of a traditional embedded system is that regardless of, of, of the powerful, how much powerful it is, it, it is designed 
inside to run a single function software. So if you take, for example, a Wi-Fi uh, router, it, it is built for this specific purpose, and you cannot change its uh, you cannot change its purpose. It's it's designed and it's, uh, you, you can change the configuration. You can click on I don't know uh, the IP address or whatever. But in in essence, it's it's just a device that it's a single purpose. And when you put a phone, you can run a game on it. You can you can run your app, but it's a phone uh, essentially. So you cannot change it. It's designed physically and logically to just run simple limited software. So we do not have general purpose software components on such a system. Even though they're currently like modern devices, and this is this is the area that the things change. So so modern smartphones they, they, they let you run your applications, even very complex ones, as, as a program externally supplied. So so they, they, they get they tend to be more similar to a laptop or uh, that you can run even, even very complex applications on there. But it's not in that way historically. So we'll, we'll talk about this. And in general, embedded systems are very, very integrated and highly integrated in terms that on one piece of silicon, you have you have the complete computer system really logically. So when you when you take a, when you break down the PC, it's, it's got a CPU on, on a socket. You've got a a, a complementary sound bridge. It's got various chipsets on it. In, in, in embedded systems, all these pieces are on one silicon uh, chip. It's, it's. So it's, uh, it's one of the characteristic uh, aspects. And, and because the systems were very simple, like the CPU were not very performant, so embedded systems had integrated within one package also some acceleration engines because the CPU, CPU couldn't handle uh, certain operations as well. Uh, there were integrated <coughs> like security engines for doing cryptography or doing some some other stuff that we will see as an example. And one other note about embedded systems is which we talked about with uh, with Davida in a break is that in general embedded systems are very diversified, which is which is in stark contrast with what is what is met in the commodity PC where we do not have any standard things. In embedded, everything is different. Everything is custom designed. So, because it, it, it serves this single purpose uh, uh, software. But this is, this is only part of the story. But the other, the other side is that we even do not have any standardization on, on the software side. So there is no, like in a PC world, there is a BIOS. If you, if you buy, uh, I don't know, PC from any vendor, you would have various BIOSs, but they are essentially compatible on an ABI level, and they are the same. In, in an embedded world, there is a bunch of bootloaders, for example. There is UBoot, there is CFE, there is UEFI, there is like plenty of customers. So there is uh, there is no a standard platform, uh, an embedded standard platform, which is which is a difficult case to handle from an OS development perspective, like we will see. Uh, and this is a common problem. How to how to have a single kernel, for example, running on various of, of systems. Uh, like in a PC, we've got generic, which runs on any AMD or any x86 system. In embedded architecture, like ARM and RPC and A, it is, it is really tough to get to the So, uh, so everything is, is custom and specially built. Uh, the, other, the other aspect also of this non-standard non, uh, non uh, approach is that we, that we very often will, will have this distinction here uh, that, that there's the CPU, that we, which defines the architecture, will be R, RPC, or MIPS, and there will be the system on chip, which is another, another step, which is this, this integrated uh, package. And these are standard. If, if you buy a silicon uh, from, so, so these are identical, but the problem uh, starts at the platform level, uh, as we call it, which is the board. When you going by a board, a specific a specific device which makes the whole the whole thing. So this is different. So the interrupts can be routed differently. The resources can be defined uh, defined and used differently because very often the uh, systems designed for embedded uh, development, uh, the silicon can be reconfigured very flexibly. So you can have uh, it's got some 
pins can be reconfigured. So depending on the on the end user application, you can, you can resign, for example, from one unit of an internet connectivity and then use it for GPIO. That's that's one of the cases. So so on the platform level, so behind behind the, the chip package, everything can be can be configured and this is why is and uh, there's no base standard platform. Okay. So, previous comments were mostly to give you some historical view how it how it how it applied and how it still holds because we need to keep in mind that even though that, that things change rapidly in a very high kind of way, all these systems the legacy systems and the old approach are still there and they are shipping millions and millions of smaller systems uh, each, each year. So, so we will we'll have a look at what is, what is the latest and what are the latest changes and tendencies. But please keep in mind that uh, like embedded systems are shipped in, in millions and billions of units, even the small systems like microcontrollers. I'm not sure if you're aware about the, some of the luxury cars, the latest cars. They, they, for example, include around 100 microcontrollers in one car. So it's like a huge number of, of systems currently. Uh, so how does the embedded world look today from a very high level perspective? So everything is more integrated and smaller than ever. So we've got physically smaller chips, but they contain more and more stuff uh, in them. Uh, so, for example, they are using the top technologies in, in, in a sense of uh, silicon production. So we, we go down to 28, 20, 16, 14 nanometers. There are, there are chips already manufactured in these, in these technologies and being delivered and shipped. Uh, and because we can we can squeeze more stuff on the same on the same die size, uh, embedded systems which were traditionally small and simple, they become very complex and they they contain now many CPUs. For example, we do not have just a single CPU inside a given system, but we've got quad core, we've got eight cores, we've got sixteen cores. Right now, there are also system in a so-called many core architecture like Hilara, which puts like 36, 72 cores in one in one physical package. It's like unbelievable. And there are also like some of the networking processors from Necronome and EasyChip, they are very specialized. They're they're pretty huge, but they, they contain 256 cores in one package or 300 cores. It's like a lot. <laughs> Very often these systems are uh, not uniform in a sense that they, they do not have the same type of, of CPU. That they, 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 there could be hybrid solutions like we've got a group of general purpose CPUs which can, which can run SMP OS for example, but they will, they will be accompanied by, uh, by ESP or network packet processing cores. So there, there could be different, uh, different combinations. So, the hardware changes very rapidly, so um, the cycles of production and deployment in embedded systems has shortened a lot. So, it, like because of the pace of the world, how it, how it changes and, uh, as a whole thing, uh, the technology also needs to change and adapt very quickly. So, so every every two years, the product is considered obsolete. So, there needs to be more uh, new. So yes, embedded systems from today uh, are very, very complex and very modern. They contain all the fully fledged MMU. They 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 become 64 bit, as we will see. Uh, they've got all the cache hierarchy as was uh, in uh, under one in Intel and AMD. They have all the modern interfaces that you can find out in, in the field right now, like the latest EDR. Uh, interfaces, uh, quick uh, serial and deserializer, uh, uh, apps, Sita Express, USB 3, SATA 3, you know. So, so historically or originally these systems were first 
Szénén egy komolyat, egy kis szív, és azt mondom, 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 System of the day, which is the system on a ship, so it means that you want silicon, the piece we've got all these guys that you can see here, you can break it, and uh, so you can see that we've got uh, like four CPU of RM7 with FPU, each running at 1.6 gigahertz. So this is one example. They, they will very quickly be doing like 2.0 gigahertz. So we've got four, four CPUs, we've got advanced power management, which means that we can. Uh, power of each of these blocks individually on and on very fine grain uh, uh, level. So you can you can run one of these CPUs and, and, and virtually turn everything off to save the power for a specific period of time. So we've got interface to, to, to the RAM. We've got to put out the cache uh, and which can be also used uh, as an S1 for Journal purpose. We would all the slow, all the slow interfaces and slow peripherals like like NAT flash, UARTs, I square C, SD card. These are, these are considered slow. We've got general purpose DNA engines in it. We can we've got security acceleration as well. And we've got high speed interfaces like we can have like four one gig interfaces in here. So you can, we've got PCI Express, which can be reconfigured depending on your needs. Uh, you can have less, with put more width of the speed, or you can have more, uh, more units and more lanes, but, but uh, uh, slower. Uh, we've got staff now, we've got, we've got USB. So, as you can observe, it's very little, like, besides this, that is needed to, for this to be a fully fleshed system. So if, if, if you take this one chip, you only need to add RAM, you, you only need to add some, I don't know, flash chips outside of it, and connections, because even the USB 5 is integrated in, in this case. So you just add some connectors, some uh, ESD protection, all the you know, tiny uh, non-intelligent stuff. So it's very easy uh, to build a very powerful and flexible system uh, with today's uh, today system chip. So, this is this is one part, but you can you can see that it's very powerful. It's got, for example, on the networking side, it's got like four gig, uh, four gig connectors, so it can it can run run really powerful uh, Ethernet switch or uh, uh, or a router. So, so this is a typical example, and it's not the most powerful really. So it's it's like a general purpose, and it and it's well suited for uh, for network. For storage, perhaps, because it has, for example, the Zor uh, engine, which can which can do Zoring, which is very important in in RAID operations. As uh, one of the examples. Uh, so, so this is, this is fairly fairly generic general purpose. It can be a it can be a void gateway because some variations of the ship have TDM interface and they can handle very little channels, for example. So it can so it can connect to an analog. Uh, landline and then do the uh, do the conversion to IP uh, traffic on the other end. So so these kind of chips are typically used in, in, in these uh, in, in these setups. So okay. So this is this is kind of a disclaimer and explanation to you because all of these uh, uh, these stories and all of all these comments that, that I shared with you they are from our point of view uh, and as I said earlier there are also other embedded systems uh, that, that we deal with but these are examples from our daily work and our uh, and our uh, experience and we, we mostly work with the higher end processors and higher end uh, uh, embedded chips which are most powerful and, and have the latest CPUs embedded in them. But please keep in mind that there's also plenty of other similar systems which are not that powerful but there are many of them. 
So you can still see on the market a lot of a, a lot of simple uh, simple solutions. Even even the, if if you are aware about I don't know AD fifty five for example, the very 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 classic the microcontroller, it's still there, it's still used, and it's still used in many, many uh, applications, and millions of these chips are shipping. Also, you can find that there are companies that do FPGA versions of these old systems that are not uh, produced anymore, but there's so many legacy software built for these old guys that, that, even, uh, that, they, that you even need to, to use an FPGA synthesized version of these very old CPUs, because you have that that lot of uh, legacy software. So this view is just for the latest stuff that is happening. So this is what, what we are working with. And we are focused on the RISC CPU. So we will be mostly talking about ARM, NAMES, and RPC, not much on x86. So that's uh, and why so much focus on ARM? Because it's, it's uh, advancing and it's uh, developing and exploding a lot these days. So if you are not following you know, the electronics and the silicon what's happening, so ARM is really you know, at, um, on its way and it's, uh, and it's expanding a lot. So there's a lot of movement. We will see some examples and I will tell you more about what is really happening. So, so R historically was, was considered a low power uh, handheld devices. This, this is where, where it came from. But now it's moving into high end and it's getting very high performance uh, CPU core plus there are vendors that produce uh, bigger systems uh, which include peripherals. So, so R uh, became multi core. So now you can see systems in the field really shipping like 16 core already, but there are coming more. So ARM is multi-core, uh, and it will be many core in, in the future. The ARM got virtualization, so, so it becomes really very similar to the commodity x86. So it, it will be able to host virtual, uh, virtual systems, virtual guest OSs on top of it. And it's becoming 64-bit, the latest ARM specifications, the D8, is is 64 bit. So it essentially becomes the general purpose computing. For it's 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 we will see. I've got I thought it was a highlight later, but I, <coughs> but now that that we lose this aspect of single purposeness is because it's a general purpose uh, system now. And there is a lot of interest and a lot of investment put by many vendors because. Maybe, maybe that's, uh, that's another point. If you are not aware, ARM is designed, the architecture is designed and maintained by ARM Holdings, which is a UK company, but they do not manufacture any real devices. They only, they only synthesize maybe a reference, a reference system and layout of the, uh, of the silicon on the so-called RPA level. But they, their business model is licensing this design to real implementers. So companies like Altera, India, or all these guys here, they buy a license from our holdings and they implement their own uh, their own solution, which is compatible with the ARM instruction set architecture. And on the surface, all these on a CPU they are compatible, but they run the same they run the same code. And if you if you call that line, you can on and one of these that they are that is supposed to be also compatible. So there's a lot of lot of interest in these companies and more uh, in in getting uh, getting into the newest RPA uh, products. Uh, most of these companies already announced, and some of them already have products already in the in the latest architecture. Uh, the others have been producing earlier uh, versions like for many years like Texas Instrument for SD Micro, they've been running ARM for many years and, and they and they all produce newer systems. Some interesting examples are companies like KVM, Freescale, LSI, which historically were selling products based on other architectures like RPC and MIPS respectively. And you can see this this really huge move and strong tendency of companies moving towards ARM. So even Freescale and outside, as I said, they were historically RPC companies, applied micro the same. 
they they stood up and, 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 and are rolling out product based on ARM architecture. So it's it's a strong it's a strong trend in, in the industry that will work with other companies. All the Samsung, Apple, if you've got an iPhone, if you've got something, if you've got Samsung phone, they are all running ARM uh, chips. And there is probably a couple, not even a simple uh, a simple chip, but probably a couple of these. So yeah, so let's talk more about the industrial trends as we, as we started already. So, so there are seen some tendencies like the industry is no longer looking and striving for pure performance like it was for a couple of years back with a single thread maximum performance from x86 and we were interested in just squeezing every bit of the ZM CPU and they are still top of the notch the pure performance to the CPU so, so they are not they can not disappear but there is a tendency and an interest in, in customers to focus more on the low power because these all these ZMs all these Intel systems like delivering the most performance they they eat a lot of power and it's very costly long term and and in, in a bigger scale, it brings a lot of costs. So low power is a holy grail and very important item to, uh, to today's market. And R is winning in, in the low power uh, field, clearly over MIPS and RPC, not to mention x 86 which is the most out of uh, so, so this is one important item. The other thing that's the result, in a sense, of this is that embedded systems based on ARM are paving their way into the server market, which is huge and currently uh, served by a single vendor, which is Intel, which takes 95% of the uh, uh, market. So, so ARM developers are hoping to just steal some part of this uh, of this case. And, uh, and also the users want alternative vendors now that they only have A and B, which is essentially like the same architecture, so they cannot they cannot really choose. Uh, so so users want alternative vendors. With R being licensed, there's no single source of, of the technology and uh, the chip. So they can they can compare and uh, they have the, the best implementation. But in that it's it's more difficult because there's not much uh, choice right now. And as 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 an effect of this, embedded systems will go and are going to the cloud and data centers because of the slow power, uh, which is very important in in the data center. Uh, context uh, in particular, because if you've got a farm of huge number of, of, of systems, like, I don't know, 20,000 computers, it's, it's a lot of money uh, each day and every hour and every second to run all this. So even even a an a savings of a couple percent on the power is like a lot of money. So so there's a great interest in getting getting this into, into shape. So this is why. So much interest and so much investment behind this. Uh, so, for example, uh, you might know about this, but Facebook is leading some initiative which is called Open Compute, uh, and, uh, and it's one of the, one of the latest uh, initiatives in this, uh, in this direction to define uh, to define a new definition and a new generation of uh, of a data center. It's, we will talk more about the microserver concept on the next slide which is mostly about the compute side, but the open compute is the whole thing. It also, it also covers the, the design of the data center in terms of connectivity, and so, so, so they made everything open, so the, so the specs are there. So uh, the data center is, is also open sourcing uh, kind, of, kind of a thing. It's a design and how to, how to build your own uh, uh, data center. Yeah, and as, I talk, and as I mentioned, we, because these embedded technologies and embedded chips will, will 
be found in these general purpose uh, environments, we lose this single purpose software aspect that, that was once uh, uh, a purpose point. So the microserver is just implementation and low-level low level definition of how things will look in the future. Not, not very distant. It is expected that ARM-based servers, they are built now, but they will be available widely next year. So maybe, maybe later this year they will be, they, they will be on the market. So, so the, purpose, the purposes are to increase density, have better stability, and this is why this new architecture comes. So uh, there will be, and there is already, uh, a compute pieces, which is a CPU and uh, memory. CPU meaning uh, SOC, really, because this is this, uh, this integrated chip which contains everything, this, this logical computer on it. So the SOC is <coughs> a company uh, memory, and it's got storage in it, it's got internet connectivity in it, so it only it only needs to have some connectors and, and an external memory. And then we can we can put many of these in slots which are PCI Express, the latest generation, which, which provide interconnect between these. And you can have many of these in one server, uh, I don't know, three you or four you The base board will only will be and is very simplified. It only contains connectivity and power control, non non intelligent uh, non intelligent pieces. It is also thought that you could inter intermix these like in one base board. You would, you could you could physically uh, host you know arm blades and intel blades in one in one folder. Because the open, uh, the open compute and, and these kind of initiatives, they, they are supported by many vendors. So we have examples here. So AMD, Intel, on the x86 front, but also by Micro and Fazia on, on ARM. So, so there's interest from, from various accounts. Kind of so this is the slide. Platforms like Pandora, 
on the board, sorry, people fall on Raspberry Pi, ship out flag, and, and stuff like that. We've got, we've got much more, but a couple dozen, I think, platforms supported right now. But these are just, you know, maybe popular, or these boards are really, really uh, cheap, so you can, you can find them. And they are relatively modern. Like, on the board is Cortex A9, which is a dual core ARMv7, so it's a really modern platform, so you can use a lot of interesting stuff with it. And uh, people call this Cortex A9, it's more towards uh, industrial control. Uh, but it's, it's also a nice, a nice guy like that's same core. Raspberry Pi is really not all the average. So there's a number of projects and activities going on in the ABC community. So last, last year, we, uh, or on the, on the verge of last year, and, and this year we have seen the IMX Freescale, uh, IMX chip fork, we have seen the <coughs> support for embedded API from the anti kernel for example. And uh, there's currently an ongoing project done by one of the guys on my team, which is Transparent Superpages for ARM. Uh, I will tell more about this uh, uh, later. So, uh, in summary, we've got all the, all the major platforms on the embedded architecture supported. So, uh, 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 so you can use FreeBSD on, on, many, on many systems right now. Yeah, so the strengths, as, as we said, we, we support all the modern CPUs uh, important in the uh, space. And FreeBSD uh, is, is a nicely portable system, as we, as we can see from my personal uh, experience and from the guys of my team. We have done uh, many ports so far. We have ported. Previously, it will be RDC, to ARM, uh, many, many families of all these systems. And we found FreeBSD very friendly in our portability form. We've got, we've got a nicely defined driver's API, we've got a new bus hierarchy definition, so the definition which is object oriented. Device drivers are really nice to write, they are very well structured, and it's really convenient to, to, to write the device drivers. Uh, FreeBSD. We've got APIs uh, which come from NetBSD originally, the bus DMA and bus space, which make clear separation on, on specific aspects, which are very important when it comes to porting to a new architecture and new chip. So, so it's typically a common layer that, is, that doesn't need to, to be ported, and you only have to focus on a very lowest level layer, which is very nice and it works well and pays off. So, so, yeah, with technologies also like the Cloud and Device Tree, which we have developed I don't know, two years ago, uh, or maybe imported and enabled because the, the concept comes from the Linux world, but it is, it is for an uh, independent way of defining a uh, configuration of that of embedded systems. I told earlier that it's very difficult to have something like a standard platform. And the technology at the key comes to help with this. So we have a human description of a platform by like saying that this system has interrupts routed this way, or that we have this block connected to this block, and we kind of describe in a simple way uh, the system, the board, how, it, how, it's, how it's laid out. And the uh, kernel can be common to a given, uh, to all, virtually all uh, boards based on, on the same chip, and you only need to provide a specific config for a given board. So this, is, this comes uh, to help with this. One strength, so we, we, have, we have the tool chains, which is, uh, which is an important item when doing, uh, when doing uh, embedded development. Uh, especially the external toolchain support is, uh, is interesting because sometimes <coughs> FreeBSD, for example, historically had the pretty old GCC and BIN tools, right? We, we, ended, we ended at some point where we couldn't import any, any more GPLV3. 
So he stayed for a long time with an old compiler uh, and being fields, which was a difficult position from a embedded systems and, uh, and working in a more architecture uh, point of view because we didn't have support for newly coming systems. So, so we, it, was, it was very difficult. So this item is very important. And we thought about the end of the which is still new, but uh, it, it's, it's, a new, it's a new promise to have very good support for ARM, for example, which is used by Apple. They are a very important item from a potential vendor and customer who would like to use PSD and PSD in particular. So they, they are looking for something that would extensively and in a, a systematic way uh, let test the system. So so these are so we put a stress group and we also have automatic test framework, which is important from that PSD. So all these items help a lot selling PSD to potential vendors and uh, Okay, so what about weaknesses? So, so these are uh, highlights that, 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 that I came up with, that we think about, uh, and where we should improve. So one, one item is that we've got all these supported platforms, and it's, and it's very nice to start with, but they sometimes are not like production ready. So there's no, uh, so there are common cases that like eventual customer who would like to use PTSD in, in a product like this, they cannot, they cannot allow for you know looking for bugs or uh, or problems when there is a device in the field. So so the platform needs to be rock solid before the customer would commit and decide for using uh, any system. Not that this is this is uh, this needs to be so. If we have no optimizations or no testing, there's less chances for the customer to, to use this. So it's one item. The other thing, very, uh, very often now, is that like most of the previous developers are working with x86, and this is it's just a, it's just a fact. It's the most popular platform. It's the most uh, most widely used, but it also has comes with consequences. Some um, code specifically related to hardware when not done with embedded architectures, especially the strict aliasing systems like ARM, RPC. Uh, they, they lead to problems and crashes when we try to, to build some drivers. They can build, but when we run them, they, they, they produce tanks. So, uh, because because they're, they're, they've got hidden assumptions uh, for the x86 architecture. So these kind of things. The one major item is that none of the embedded architectures are part of CMAPs is tier one's, uh, tier one's stages. So sometimes we, we have like low performance when the customer comes to us, uh, my company, and asking why should we use 3DSD or we try to sell 3DSD to them or any DSD. They ask for numbers, that, that's what it is. They, they show me the performance and maybe I will, I will use it. So, so if there's no performance to back the greatness of, of the DSD, they don't like it. Sorry. <laughs> So they, they, they very often test and convert various OSs before they commit to, uh, to using a printer or one uh, So yes, so we should we should look at the challenges. So Linux is everywhere in a bed. That's that's a hack. You, you just you just have to deal with this. Nobody knows BSD in in general. There are some cases, but from the high level, like nobody knows this, and you have to explain to them, to them and learn.
health departments and health uh, uh, uses. So it's contrary to some, uh, some thoughts and hopes, but the reality is that most of the customers do not care about GPL at all. And there are some who fear this, but uh, in, in general it's, uh, it's not a problem to companies. They, they can circumvent it, they can, they can modularize it, so they, they, they are not forced to, uh, to publish all the sources, so they can keep their, their ID and their differentiators safely. So in general, we cannot, we cannot win on the DSP license alone. It's, like, it's no problem for... Uh, and, and yes, and it's many companies, many vendors. Uh, there's also there's also gray area and uncertainty because sometimes sometimes the uh, the GNU uh, organization can can try to I don't know, come after you and then nobody knows what what happens. But the, the vendors are not clear about this. If it, it didn't happen. And if they if they can also search certain uh, the, the, the typical cases they are they are fine with it. So the GPLv2 is a no uh, uh, some problem for for uh, I think that's that's quite an important point because GPLv3 is a different deal. Yes, quite yes, a it's a different story. It's a different story. <laughs> but Linux, Linux would not go V3. Yes. So, yes, that, that, that's, that's true. So how to stay relevant? We need to make one of the platform tier one. Uh, so also another suggestion and another point is we should prepare for the upcoming ARM server wave. It is on its way and there will be, there will be a lot of systems next year, but there will be, at least now, there are already systems developed by Dell, HP, whoever, and we should prepare for this and have a good support, which means RPA, because all the servers, the real servers, should be 64 bit. So, so there's a lot of work behind the scenes on the Linux front, and we should we should at least try to try to prepare for this. There are some other items like it's very difficult to come up with generic kernel for embedded. As we talk, because of this, of this variety of configuration, and it's nice to be able to But it would be nice to have pre-built systems for people, for vendors, companies to test and do some reference uh, uh, validation. And it was mentioned earlier today that we should have more people working on PBSD on, on the embedded side. It's very tough to do. The work and development embedded is. is Unpleasant very often, it's not spectacular, it doesn't give you know much fame and glory. So don't be hard. Okay. Yeah, let me quite quickly I'm just kind of fine. Let me quickly uh, tell you what we do as I have. So we have done a number of ports, so we have ported previously to RPC, these, these guys are RPC, modern uh, embedded uh, systems. We have done a number of ARM ports for Merkel families. We have done Texas Instruments ports. Most of this stuff has been integrated with Valida's entry. So we typically work with customers uh, and so that all the pieces that are not related to their ID, we ask them and push for letting us publish it. So that, 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 that's what we try to do. So it's been quite successful and companies get educated with this. So, so at some point they even ask us <laughs> to do this as part of our uh, project. So, 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 so we have we have brought the FDP, so we integrated the FDP for, for these. So it was supported by the three foundation. Yeah, we've done a lot of work on the previous the ARM infrastructure. So the so the more modern system like V6 and V7 support we have done it. We have done the SMP infrastructure. It was a piece of ARM common SMP infrastructure apart from uh, the specific CPU. We have also developed a non-flash environment, which was the device driver framework, and then the 
log structured file system to work on all the NAND flashes because NAND flashes are very often the major storage device on NAND systems. There is somewhere that cannot have mechanical disks in them. So having support for being modern, non-oriented file system is an important thing. So, so we have to develop this together with one of our commercial partners and then we also managed to publish it last year or something like that. Currently we are working on transparent super pages for ARM. If, if you are not aware, super pages technology is a flexible and intelligent way of using PLD, which is cache for translation of virtual physical addresses. And it, it is an optimization for using you know, larger areas if, if they are needed. Typically, typical TLB are just uh, using fixed uh, page sizes, and the, in certain workloads, you end up in a situation that there's many, many overhead, much overhead, with many flushes and many validations, and replacement with new, which is which is just overhead, and you can you can detect these and, and manage this intelligently. So so if a specific area of virtual memory is used uh, intensively, it, it should have just one translation, big one. But it requires, on the one hand, hardware support, and on the other, software infrastructure. So, so this is what we're working right now. So we are speaking at conferences where mentoring students, the GSO, who put a couple of colors on the previous project. So, let me tell you about Tomorrow, this is the last slide. <laughs> uh, things that we have done uh, recently. So why is the net is important? So we also do not use about that. And it is important uh, to one of the more modern uh, Marvel systems, which is a quad core Armada XP. Very powerful. Uh, it's actually the, the, the diagram that I showed you in the beginning is, is from this system. So we have we have done this for one of our commercial customers. It's been thoroughly tested. It's it's in a well, uh, very well shaped. It's just single core support. There's no SMP on it. And we uh, we are trying to merge it with official CDS. We've got a friend, an ESD developer in Poland, and who is cooperating with us. And we just uh, got agreement to just publish this. Uh, and the, Gave it to him, and he and he is running this through an uh, MSD process uh, and peer reviews and everything. So it should be it should be uh, more active in the coming weeks. So we are ready, and we want to push it out. And also, one the other interesting project I want to mention to you is uh, it's kind of hybrid. Why? Right? And this is why it's interesting because we we have taken FreeBSD TCP IP stack, kernel TCP IP stack, we broke, we have broken it down to pieces and merged it to a Linux based, user space, very high performance, many core, 30, 36 core system. So uh, in order to achieve the very high performance TCP IP stack in the user space, which was supposed to run 40G, triple boot with very low latency uh, on the system. And uh, so this is a real example of how the BSD license can be also merged with, <laughs> with our components. So, so that's, that's really 